still and just let God talk. Amen. We're, we're going into our series on, it's called Amplified. This is the first lesson of our series. It will be a six-week series. And um, I, I'm basing this series on an article I read from Outreach Magazine that caught my attention that has caused me to um, develop this series. And basically, it's called Amplified, the six pandemics that COVID amplified. So for over two years, everything that has been talked about has been about COVID. And unfortunately, in the middle of all that, a lot of other things have happened that have not been talked about enough. And so tonight, I'm going to talk about the pandemic of mental illness. Um, I don't claim to be qualified as a doctor, obviously. I don't claim to be qualified to give expert advice in this area. But I am going to share with you some information that, that I'm <clears throat> bringing to you tonight. And then we're going to add scripture to it. And I, I, I want to talk to us a little bit because a lot of this stuff is happening in our society during COVID, and it's not being talked about enough. And unfortunately, it is also coming and, min and, and happening and being in our congregations. So tonight, I want to talk to you about the pandemic of mental illness. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen an increase in mental health issues and we will continue to see an increase in these issues for decades to come. Uh, pastors will and are experiencing a higher level of situations where people just do not feel the peace be still or the stillness of peace or the assurance of society like they did even before COVID. The, the rise in mental health needs has far outstripped the ability for the mental health care workers to keep up. And so what's happening, and this is real stuff, I mean, prices to talk to someone alone has skyrocketed. And the reason is, is they're trying to eliminate cases that don't have enough finance or insurance to do because there is an overload of people who need help. You can have your opinions on whether that's good or bad. The facts of the matter is it's happening. And in many regions of our country, counselors are so overwhelmed that they cannot take any new patients. So, you have people not being trained fast enough to deal with things that they've never dealt with before, as in a pandemic, and then the amplified versions of different pandemics that were here before, but have been magnified through the last two years. According to the Mayo Clinic, surveys show a major increase in the number of, and this is on uh, U.S. adults, but it's, it's across North America, who report symptoms of stress, anxiety, depression, insomnia during the pandemic compared with surveys before. They are seeing skyrocketing numbers. Some people have increased their use of alcohol or drugs, thinking that that can help them cope with their fears about the pandemic, people are turning to all types of issues. And unfortunately, some of that is even coming into the church. The Kaiser Family Foundation, these are professional reports, reports that anxiety and depression have increased fourfold during the pandemic. During the pandemic, there is about four out of 10 adults that have reported symptoms of 
anxiety or depressive disorder. Um, and that is in comparison to one out of 10 before the pandemic. Now, I want to share with you, that's four times as many, obviously, as you can figure out quickly. But that is only the people willing to admit that there's an issue. So we have quadrupled in people that are dealing with issues, and those are the, only the ones that have actually been willing to say. So when, when we're talking about this series, it's not just some neat little thing that I want to share with you over the next six weeks. I'm talking about the realness of where we are in dealing with individuals that are coming into our congregations, uh, situations that we're dealing with. And so, folks, this is, this is a reality check that has to happen for our church. Not just Mission Point, but for the church. Okay, it's not going to be enough to say, you know, just, just um, go home and, and, and um, put your feet up and um, it'll all go away. Ain't happening. Okay. Pastors can address this from the pulpit. Of course, we can increase our focus on pastoral care. We can make any local mental health facilities available to our congregations. And, and even in the case of myself, um, if I feel like it's out of my abilities, then obviously a person needs to be referred. But the coronavirus pandemic has resulted in unprecedented hazards to mental health around the world. Relatively high rates, folks, of anxiety and depression and PTSD, psychological distress and stress, they were reported in the general population. So it's not just certain demographics. It's across the board. And there's common risk factors that are associated with this uh, distress. And of course, uh, we see higher rates during the pandemic, which with females, um, the, the female gender is dealing even in a greater sense with these issues. Younger age uh, people, especially under the age of 40. And a lot of that would take into consideration, obviously, young families. And so you have uh, couples, single moms, dads, single people under the age of 40 that this has, these numbers have skyrocketed. And um, you have um, chronic illnesses, you have unemployment, you have student status, you have uh, frequent exposure to social media news concerning COVID-19 that has got people into a frenzy. If you're not careful, you'll mess up your head with listening to too much stuff. I'm just going to say it plain. Is that okay? It'll mess you up. You'll get off into conspiracy theories and everything else. Listen, don't allow yourself to go there. It's not worth the mind games. And so as a major outbreak that has happened in the 21st century, this, this disease or this pandemic has led to unprecedented hazards that people are dealing with, not just, you know, an hour of the week, I mean every day. And so there's been a systematic search that has been conducted by multiple organizations, uh, PubMed, Embros, Medicine, Web of Science, Scopus, these are things that have been, uh, I mean, they're trying to search for answers. Articles were, are, are being selected to try to come up with the right criteria. Just give you an example. High rates of symptoms of anxiety um, went, and you'll notice uh, the green is what it was before the pandemic. The purple is what it is now. Just to give you an example. Anxiety, 
Right now, 50.9% of people are dealing with anxiety. We've gone from 6% to 50%. You look at depression, depression, 14% of people deal with depression before COVID. Currently, 48% of people are dealing with depression. I'm not trying to make you sad. I'm trying to be, bring a realistic view to what's happening in our society and the importance of, of, uh, of the Lord in our situations. Um, Post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, PTSD, 7% of people dealt with it before. 53% are dealing with it now. And you can go across the board. Look at the last one, stress. Okay, I'm talking now. This is serious stuff, folks. Stress before COVID, 8% of people dealt with stress. Right now, 81%. Less than 20% of people don't deal with it. I mean, 10 times the amount of people are dealing with stress in 2022 than they were in 2020. Now, we could talk about all the reasons for that. I mean, there's all, I mean, we could spend the night talking about the reasons for that. The fact of the matter is it's happening. And so something's, something's got to come to our thinking. Uh, the pandemic is associated with highly significant levels, uh, obviously, of psychological distress. In many cases, they would meet the threshold for clinical uh, relevance, mitigating and hazardous effects on mental health uh, is an institutional public health priority. And so what's happening is they're seeing that this is taking place and they're beginning to see more and more, but what's the solutions? Because when you have a population that has 10 times gone from stress level of 8% of population to 81, there is not enough people taking care of people to handle that amount of obligation. Canadians report a lower self-perceived mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is an article done by Leanne Finley and Ruhab Aram. Fewer Canadians are reporting that they have excellent or very good mental health, particularly women, but overall Canadians report better physical health, but worse mental health. So what has happened is we had a pandemic for two years that people actually got on the treadmill <laughs> and they're exercising. I mean, they sold all kinds of equipment, okay? Physical health, is taking place. People actually had a little more time to do such things. But mental health has decreased substantially. According to the recent Canadian Perspective Survey Series, 54% of Canadians aged 15 and older reported excellent or very good mental health during COVID-19 period. And that compares to findings from 2018, where it was 68%. So it dropped People saying that they were good mental health went down 14% in that length of time. Uh, Canadians aged 15 and older said that their mental health was excellent or very good beforehand. Okay, so this is, this is a serious stuff. Women in particular were more likely to report poor mental health as compared to men. About half of women said their mental health was excellent or very good. Um, Prior to 2018, it was 60%. So, uh, again, uh, you got situations where people are not seeing the hope like they did even before. Okay? More Canadians reported that their physical health was excellent or very good. So it went from 60% 60, 60 to 69%. People actually were feeling better about the physical health, but a lot less about their mental health. And youth are less likely to report uh, anything good about their mental health. So the numbers are probably, don't want to make this worse, but they're probably worse 
than what they really appear. All age groups, except individuals age 65 and older, were less likely to report excellent or very good mental health during COVID-19. And so you have, uh, you have a situation where we are in a pandemic. You thought, well, it's over. <laughs> it's just beginning. The results suggest that Canadians' overall mental health has decreased during the pandemic, women and young Canadians. So where, where is this going to change? And how is it going to improve? Because it's got to, if we're going to reach people that are in need, it's not enough just to say you're going to be okay. There was a stigma decades ago that if you were a Christian, that you didn't deal with these problems. That is a false. That is, I mean, that perception is not true. You say, well, pastor, you know, you should have more faith than that. The real world is that it's not actually true. We have to be prepared spiritually, biblically, and a supernatural move of God if we're going to deal with the pandemic of mental illness. We must. Brother Grant alluded to the scripture of Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, that's the type of peace that goes beyond being able to fathom how you got it. Okay? That's what's going to bring an assurance to us as individuals and to people that are looking for an answer to their problem. It must not be that we say you'll get over it. You go to the altar and pray through and everything's going to be good. It must not be that we say, you know what? You just, you just uh, be around the right people. and you just, All those things are positive attributes to helping. But we need, we need a supernatural transformation of God's power and presence to help people through very difficult times in their lives. We've alluded to this scripture in the last few weeks as well. Last Wednesday, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you, 1 Peter 5 and 7. But I'm going to take, uh, over the next few moments, my text tonight from a very unique passage that deals with mental illness. And I'm taking it from Jonah. Jonah chapter 2 and verse 5. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Now, I don't know how many times you've read Jonah chapter 2. Probably a number of times. And I'm sure, as most of us, I think, would probably approach it, you know, that's quite a story. He got swallowed by a whale. Three days later, he got spit up on the shore. Finally, he did what God told him to do and went and preached to the, to the town of Nineveh, and everybody got saved. And that's, that's a, a neat perspective of it. But let me tell you, none of us have been in the belly of a whale 
And I can't even imagine for a second what it would have been like. All I can do is tell you what Jonah said. Jonah said, the waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me, and weeds were wrapped around my head. Now, I don't know if you're claustrophobic, but this, this, this verse, when it says that the waters compass me about, even my soul, it, it, it makes it seem that, I mean, he was, he was being deprived of life to the point where he felt like there was no hope left. How much hope can you actually feel in the belly of a whale? It's not like you can turn on the light. I can assure you that Jonah wasn't the only thing in there. however many hundreds of pounds of stuff that the whale would eat on a daily basis. I don't think it just all of a sudden swallowed Jonah and said, you know, I think I'm full. I don't think there was a clean out before Jonah arrived. I don't think the smell and the gases and everything else inside had disappeared. Jonah kind of gives us the idea that it probably wasn't the holiday in. Words which to others were figures of distress. He says, the waters have come even to the soul. The reality was Jonah did not think he was coming out alive. I mean, sure, in the... I mean, you see him dunk, sunk into the deep seas. The, the water is, I mean, they're penetrating through the depths and the breadths of the water. And, and I mean, the Bible even says here that the weeds were wrapped around his head. You know that there's symbolism in that. This may be understood literally, obviously. I mean, he was covered in seaweed, let's say. I don't know if it was just seaweed, but the Bible calls it weeds. He was covered in weeds. They were, they were uh, bound around his head. He, he finds himself in the, the stomach of this whale together with what we probably assume is seaweed, such like, uh, and maybe other marine substances, which the fish would have taken in on a regular basis. But it encompassed me. It encircled me. It was surrounding me, he said. I was, I was bound to a, a point where I was motionless. The weed was wrapped around my head like a grave band. The weed was, uh, uh, this, this probably more than likely seaweed uh, uh, would have been n near the surface of the sea. And I'm not a swimmer. I am far from a swimmer. I will never be a swimmer. Not unless I'm thrown overboard and I have to try to learn on the fly. But I don't think anyone gets excited about swimming in the seaweed. I don't think there's any excitement about that. If you're walking on the shore, you actually try to walk around the seaweed. Well, there's seaweed. I'm going right for that. I'm going to walk right over that. I'm going to feel that between my toes. I'm going to make sure, yeah, I want to get some of that seaweed on. No. I mean, it's the opposite of that. You, in most cases, you try to avoid it. And poor Jonah is in a situation where it's got him in a bound state. And you know what? The symbolism, literally, obviously, it's there. But there's a symbolism of what Jonah was feeling he was feeling absolute despair, utter hopelessness. We use words today like anxiety and stress and depression. The Bible is saying Jonah felt like he had no way out. Our world and society 
is absolutely filled with those types of scenarios. As a pastor, I received calls, meetings, emails on a continual basis of people desiring the right words, the right sentence, the right scripture, the encouragement needed just to get over the hump, just to untangle, if you want to say, from the seaweed of life. And there is a struggle that's happening in people's minds. And we are dealing with it even inside the church. And so what has to happen, there has to be, and I'm just looking at this passage. I, when I read this passage, it, it, it kind of intrigued me that I wonder exactly what Jonah was feeling like. It's not like he could call someone. There was no texting allowed. No email sent. No one to talk to. There was no sweet smell. There was no encouragement. There was no hope at all. In himself, it was done, over. That's what people feel when they deal with mental illness. How am I ever going to get out of this situation? He said, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. He went down to, the, he says, to the bottom of the mountains. The idea there is literally understood in the sense that the fish um, followed the, 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 the base of the mountains and, and would keep going down where you would have you would have hills coming up out of the water, and the, and, and the whale is going to that bottom, literally. Jonah can't see that that's happening. He just senses that it is. I feel like I'm still going down. How bad can it get? I'm in here with no hope. No end in sight, and I feel like I'm going down farther. I don't know how deep the water was, where Jonah was. All we know is he had a sense that he was still going down, and he uses a term that's very intriguing in the Scripture. He was encompassed, surrounded, covered by bars. It's like an imprisonment. This is what people are dealing with in the real world. Okay. Um, well, Jonah calls it the earth. The earth with her bars. He represents himself as a prisoner of the dungeon that he is in. He's closed in that he cannot be removed. And he says that it's going to be forever. What's that? What's, what's, what's it being implied? It's, be, it's being implied that however long it takes for him to die, that's where he's going to remain. There's no buttons to press. There's no elevator to get out. There's no stairway. There's nothing. He feels like this is the end of the journey for him. Bars have enclosed him, and it is forever. The place where his life will terminate. They were the dungeon walls. And yet in the middle of this very desperate situation, which I would attribute to that this is a severe case of mental depression, illness. I mean, you can call it. Stress, it's, I think it's even greater than that. Where he feels like this is the end of the road, done, not seeing anyone again, over. And yet in the middle of that, he says, yet thou hast brought up my life. 
<laughs> the substance of this poetic prayer is composed while in the fish's belly. This is not afterwards, and I'm going to journal about my experience. <laughs> I'm going to write down, and I'm going to, I'm going to share my thoughts of my trip. No, this is while he's in the, the whale's belly. And this prophet appears to have thrown it out in some present poetic form where he says, yet thou hast brought up my life. This is in the middle of his dilemma. Okay? This is not afterwards. This is not someone sending him a note. Right in the middle of everything that feels like it's going to terminate his life. Yet there is a flicker. A flicker of hope. A radiant of some type of deliverance. Yet thou hast brought up my life. Is what he says. Now notice. He said you brought it up from the pit. O oh Lord my God. He kind of gives this idea in the middle of a terrible situation. I've got one answer left. I've got one lifeline available. I've got one more thing to rely on. I've only got one, one opportunity to turn. And it's going to be whether God can get me out of this situation. I'm not against medication. I'm not against doctors. I'm not against any of those things. I feel like when I talk to people and tell them, listen, you do everything you can for self-care personally. And if it still isn't enough, then you may need to rely on something for a period of time. And I have no problem saying that. But the key to all of that is, has the Lord been cried unto from the pit? Has the Lord been reached for from the belly of the whale? Has the Lord been stretched out to from absolute termination? Has the distress call been given to what God can do? And listen, the church, without question, has to rise to the challenge of our society and not ignore and not pass off that things are not real and they're not true. That is, we can't do that. But there has to be something that is still brought forth as a lifeline. This is what Jonah said. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee in thy holy temple. When I had given up all hope. When everything else was not working, when all the counseling sessions did not bring a solution, when I didn't feel better with everything that was offered to me, in the middle of that, I remembered the Lord. Literally means I was covered within me. When I was dizzied or overwhelmed the word is the word that's used is actually faintness from heat thirst exhaustion have you ever heard that word a little bit in the last two years i feel absolutely exhausted anyone heard that word maybe a few of us have used it That's the feeling that comes. Absolute, complete exhaustion. I don't know if I can keep 
doing this every day. I have to tell you, um, I know you all had issues, obviously dealing with work and situations and schools, and I can't even imagine all of it. I, I really can't. I can only come from the perspective as a pastor that it was not something that happened once a week. It was daily. Guidelines were changing sometimes multiple times in the same day. Most guidelines changed on Friday, <laughs> two days before Sunday. And the guidelines for the Atlantic District were never the same because we have three provinces, and none of them agreed. And so in the middle of that, when my, when my soul fainted, when I felt exhaustion, when, when there was a, a film that came over my eyes that I'm like, I'm, it's glazed over right now. <laughs> my head is fuzzy. Okay, I don't know how, I don't know what kind of terms you use. <laughs> okay? Cloudy, fuzzy. I mean, these are the things that work for me. Can't think straight. Okay? Um, the brain is on autopilot. And all of a sudden, we feel like our soul the very being of our life is we got our, the cars up on blocks, but the wheels are going 100 miles an hour. We're not getting anywhere, yet all the energy is still being given. That's what the feeling. Well, think of that in the terms of our daily lives. Magnify that by four times, by ten times, by however many times, uh, people who are dealing with mental illness. That's why, that's why suicide rates skyrocketed. That's why people, maybe the, one of the saddest things that I heard the whole time of the pandemic was a lady who was not allowed, she was an elderly lady, and she wasn't allowed to see her family, and she opted for assisted suicide because she could no longer take being away from her family. Listen, I'm not here to be political about it. That's, that's not my goal. What my goal is that we need a supernatural demonstration of the power of God that when you remember who you're crying to and who your prayer is to and what pit you're in and what bars are surrounding you and how much seaweed is around your life uh, that you still cry unto the almighty God because that's the person that can get you out of what you're in. Our full reliance has to be first upon the Lord our Savior. Let me tell you something. You're not anybody else's savior. You've got to get them to remember who they're praying to. God help us. God help us to put our full reliance. Uh, I can't even imagine what poor Jonah was going through. But in the middle of that situation, he remembered, he remembered the Lord. Listen, I could share all kinds of incredible, neat facts with you about how far the whale had to swim before Jonah was upchucked on the shore. If you ever want to study something neat, find out how far the whale had to go to get Jonah to where he needed to be put on the shore because the whale didn't go across land. Okay, it was a thousand miles across land from where Moses was swallowed to where Moses was landed on the shore. It was about 3,000 miles by water. All you have to do is figure out how fast a, a, a whale goes, and you'll figure out how quick that the miracle was that it wasn't just Jonah 
that the miracle happened to. It was absolutely a whale on turbo. And no wonder the whale got sick. In all of that situation, my prayer, he said, came in unto thee. His prayer was personified. It represented as, as a message going out of his distress. And the Bible says it entered into the temple of God. It got to the very throne room of his presence. A very fine and delicate image is, is given here. It's so interesting that Brother Grant mentioned about just being still and listening. And that we, we didn't talk before about what we were going to discuss and about me telling the staff not to talk in prayer and all that stuff. But it's so true. It's a very fine and delicate situation that Jonah said, I got I to gotta get to the throne room and I've got to have an answer I've got to listen. I've got to, God's got to change this situation or it's not going to change. Would you stand tonight? God, who is holy everywhere, but the whole of him is nowhere. But yet he was in the temple. The temple of of the prayer, the holy temple. That's what Jonah says. He says, um, my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Somehow, in the middle of this terrible situation, Jonah only had one reliance, and that was on God. And if God wasn't going to get him out of it, that, that was it. And so in 2022, church, we can talk about COVID for till the cows come home, and people have. And it's become, it's become a word that some, some people don't even want to say anymore. In the middle of that pandemic, the mental illness has been amplified. We need the Lord to minister to people's minds. The verse that was mentioned in Philippians, that peace that goes way beyond understanding will keep your heart and mind. God, I pray right now for every person that's in this church, every person that's watching or listening online tonight. God, we're, we're, we're deep in, going deep into this series. God, we're kicking off this first night. God, we understand. We can't fully grasp what, what Jonah was going through. But God, we can see a picture of it, it wasn't pretty. But we know that he remembered. He remembered, God, you. And I pray every person that's in this room right now or watching or listening online, God, they would remember who you are. They would remember that they can call upon you. They would remember that their reliance is on you. They would remember that their prayer will go into your holy temple tonight. And God, something Something supernatural can take place uh, in their lives, God. Uh, there can be a miraculous healing that happens instantaneously. Uh, or, God, there can be a process of healing that brings them, God, into a safe place with you uh, and a, an assurance with you, God, whatever that process is. Uh, I pray that every person and every individual would put their full hope and trust uh, in you and you alone. Uh, God, that you would do everything possible, God, in their lives lives as an individual. It's not about us, God. It'll never be about us. It's only about you. It's only what you can do, and it's only what you can accomplish. Oh, God, let your peace tonight, Lord, minister to every heart and mind in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I'll say this in closing. I was sharing this with my wife a few days ago. We were talking about how fortunate we were as a church to have a team. And we could rely on each other and to keep ourselves strong. But there's a lot of individuals that didn't have people. And they're relying on phones and they're relying on FaceTime and they're relying on email and they're relying. There's a lot of people that very much felt isolated. Even to the point of ministry that didn't have another or a good team or a big team working with them. Didn't have other individuals to, to, to hold them up and, and to encourage. And our, our, our churches, our society, our families, and even our ministry are struggling with some of the things that has been given in statistics tonight. But we've got to remember, we've got to remember that God can take away the seaweed, open the bars, bring up out of the pit, get up from underneath the depths of the sea, and allow his presence to revive and restore and renew and revive us spiritually if we will get our prayer to the holy temple. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Brother Scott, why don't you come and pray for this wonderful congregation tonight? <laughs> I'm a Scott, and he's a Scott. And I just want, in closing, Pastor said some things that we all can think about in this next number of days. There's a word in, in French that mirrors our word trust, and it literally means to say the things you've not said before, to confide the things that you're wrestling with. And in my deep depression, in the midst of all the stuff that we faced, I begin to talk to him like I've never talked to him before. So I invite you as we pray together. Lord Jesus, we trust you because as we go to you, the church, the body of Christ, so those that we're connected to, that we work with, that we love, can go to you as well. And so together we walk into your place, your tabernacle, your presence, and we trust you with that which we've wrestled with. We trust you with the darkness. We trust you with the pain. We trust you with the confusion. We trust you, Lord God, with every mentality that has caused us, like Jonah, to be in dark places. And as we trust you and as we go to you, Lord Jesus, we will be there as a light of your grace for those who look to us to lead them forward to who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, church, for your faithfulness to Bible study. God bless you tonight.